Welcome to the Beyond Barriers podcast. If you're an ambitious woman who wants to advance in leadership, then this podcast is for you. This podcast is co-hosted by Nikki Barua, digital innovator, serial entrepreneur, author, and speaker, and Monique Marquez, senior corporate leader, ex-Googler, and diversity expert. From inspiring stories to cutting edge strategies, you'll learn how to develop the skill set, mindset, and tool set to get future ready fast and accelerate your success. Hi, I'm Nikki Barua, your host for today's episode. What does it really take to stand out as a high performer who gets those big opportunities? That's the question we'll be addressing in this episode. Being great at your job is important, but to accelerate your career success, your value add must go beyond your job description. Your ability to solve those hard problems and create value in new ways is what makes you more valuable. In this episode, Elisa Steele, CEO and board director, shares her perspective on creating value through relationships and problem solving. She challenges everyone to be proactive in seeking those hard assignments where there is a need for change and to do what it takes to solve problems instead of simply accepting the status quo. Elisa attributes her own successes to always going above and beyond in creating value for others. Elisa has held numerous C-suite roles, including CEO of Namely, CEO of Jive, CMO of Consumer Apps and Services at Microsoft, CMO at Skype, EVP and CMO at Yahoo. Elisa also has deep board experience, serving on multiple committees for both public and private companies. Currently, Elisa is a board director at Bumble, chairman of the board at Cornerstone On Demand, and member of the board of Splunk and Namely. She's a member of the National Association of Corporate Directors and participates in the Equilar Board Leadership Program. Elisa has been recognized for her leadership throughout the years, building strong teams, networks, and ecosystems. She was recognized by the Stevie American Business Awards for Executive of the Year and Woman of the Year, as well as named a Woman of Influence by the Silicon Valley Business Journal. Visit IamBeyondBarriers.com where you'll find show notes and links to all the resources in this episode, including the best way to get in touch with Elisa. Hi, Elisa. Great to have you on the show. Thank you so much for joining us on the Beyond Barriers podcast. Hi, I'm very excited. This is going to be fun. So this is such an important interview, and I couldn't be more delighted to be able to share your story and your strategies with our audience. Um, You are in the very tiny percentage of C-suite women leaders and board directors in the world, especially in the tech industry. So your perspective is so important for so many women around the world to learn from. So I want to take us back to where it all began. Tell us your formation story. Well, you know, I was thinking about this when you asked me to be on the show. And what is my formation story? It's really about two things. One, it's about uh, loving the customer. And, you know, my very first jobs were all about sales. I was a Mm. salesperson. I carried a bag. I had a quota. Um, And I learned very early on in my career in selling enterprise solutions, of Mm. which I was trying to learn what they even were is that when you build relationships and help people solve problems, you create value. Mm. And so I loved being in sales, but why did I even go into sales in the first place? I had no idea that I would say something like what I just said about creating value. I really was looking for a way to absolutely create a plan for myself to have financial freedom. Mm. I knew that I didn't want to depend on anybody else throughout my life. I wanted to be able to make decisions on my own. I wanted to have my own independent choice of what I wanted to do. And so I knew I had to start something that would start to create some financial gain for me Mm -hmm. because to to me, financial gain created independence, Mm -hmm. not just financial independence, but decisions about my life that I wanted to make, I needed and wanted to have freedom. So I went into sales thinking, I'll make a lot of money. <laughs> and, and it sounds so shallow, but it wasn't shallow at all. It was yeah. about me creating a foundation for my life where I could make decisions and create turning points for myself that wasn't on somebody else's agenda, but mm-hmm. on my own. And in sales, I learned this great thing about customers and relationships and creating really trusted, enduring relationships that created value. 
That is phenomenal. One of the things that um, is often associated with the um, gender gap in women rising up to C-suite and board roles is aligning to PL positions and sales experience. Yeah. Um, did you draw that connection back then? Or how much do you think that foundation really helped you not only develop the skills and competency, but also the confidence? Yeah, I had no idea back then. I could never articulate something so sophisticated like you just did. <laughs> All I knew is that if I met my quota, I would make 100% of my commissions. And if I went over my quota, that I could get to the accelerators. And I cared about that. I cared about that a lot. But what happened over time is I realized what you just said, which is when I went to meetings or when I was trying to solve a customer problem, I couldn't solve the problem by going to my sales manager. Mm. I solved the problem by talking to the product team, by getting to know the engineers, by understanding the headquarters um, philosophies and methodologies and policies. I, you actually learn about the whole business because you're trying to solve a customer problem, which means you need something from the company potentially to change, whether it's a product roadmap or a technology protocol or a policy on how we do billing or um, uh, whatever it may be. And so that is what really turned the light bulb on for me. And I realized, wow, this is how business is done. <laughs> Mm, that is powerful because it really gives you such a holistic perspective on business as you're trying to serve the customer. And Very, very early in my career. Yeah. And now that I look back on it, and I have to totally admit when I was in operating positions, hiring people, whether it was a head of sales or a head of marketing or even a CEO, I cared a ton if that person had sales experience. It didn't have to be for long periods of time, but the fact that that person sat in those shoes and dealt with customers and represented the company, because what sales is, is not just building relationships, but like I said, you're constantly solving problems, you're overcoming obstacles, you're figuring out a path forward together. And that is um, conducting good business and showing leadership. Right. Absolutely. Now you also started off in enterprise sales, which is the hardest thing there can be. It's a complex sale, a complex process and big dollar values. Yeah. Uh, my background is in enterprise sales as well, so I can completely relate. Um, tell me how you develop that skill. Like the, you know, it's one thing getting the role and yeah. other things sort of figuring it out and what helped you uh, develop that mastery. Well, I'll tell you a quick funny story. I mean, when I first started, I worked for the business um, division of AT&T. And at the time, you know, that was the part of the business that sold these big enterprise software. It's called Software Defined Network Solutions to big companies. And I was in a training program. I was 21 years old. I was in a training program. Most of the people I worked with were definitely my senior in age and certainly my senior in experience. And my job was to follow them around and learn and potentially help them with some of their homework or whatever needed to happen for the customer meeting. And um, very quickly, I learned that these um, AEs or account executives had these really large bags. I mean, they had 20, 30 customers in their bag, but they only spent time with four or five of them because those were the customers that they could nurture and sell things to, and they didn't have time for the rest. And I realized after a couple months that, wow, there's like all these customers that don't get any phone calls, that don't get any attention. And of course, their uh, trajectory and trend curve is going down. They're not spending any money with us and mm -hmm. generally have negative ratings against the company. And so I got kind of bored following everybody around. And I said at a meeting one day, hey, why don't why doesn't everybody give me their bottom three accounts? And I'll go talk to them. I'll go see what's going on. We'll go figure out if we can turn some of them around. And um, I think most of the people in that room kind of snickered at the young girl of, yeah, sure. Let's." <laughs> so they called me the, the, um, the sales uh, rep for the dog accounts. <laughs> and, um, and so they gladly gave me all their bottom accounts. That was something great for them because it took the weight off the trend line that was going yeah. down and they transferred all to me. And I started calling these customers who were either angry, ignored, 
or, you know, something in between. And, you know, what happened over time, of course, is, you know, I started learning all the reasons why they weren't doing business with us. And I couldn't turn all of them around, but I certainly turned some of them around Mm -hmm. and started to be able to change the nature of the relationship and the amount of money that they spent with the company. And I started to make these big commission checks. And it was fantastic. I loved it. And then when the accounts turned around, all the rest of the senior team said, it's time to transfer that back to me. I said, wait a second. (laughs) Hold on. So, no, it was a huge learning for me. Like, and I think it's an actual um, kind of one of my career learnings or maybe even a career tip to people who are at the beginning of their career, take the hard assignments, Mm. take the tough ones because you learn exponentially more than you learn in the easy assignments and you do it early in your career, you have so much that you bring with you going forward and taking those dog accounts and spending, we actually created a new, um, uh, a whole new uh, sales man. I, I got promoted into a sales, my first sales manager job the next year. And we called it the win back team. Oh, wow. And we took all the dog accounts, even more than I had taken as an individual. And we created a group and we hired young college hires like myself into the group to go after these dog accounts. And we significantly and meaningful, meaningfully created new revenue streams for the company those few years that we, that we created this new, wow. new approach. But I didn't know it was going to lead to that. Yeah. Um, I would just say those hard assignments, those tough problems, go get close to them. Because you learn a lot. You may be able to solve some of them. You might not be able to solve all of them, but you certainly will come out a stronger leader, a more informed business person, and you create good relationships when you try to solve a problem because you can never solve something complicated alone. You Mm -hmm. do it with a team. So you start to forge relationships with people that have other expertise than you. Maybe it's an engineer. Maybe it's a lawyer. You know, someone who's maybe not in your area of expertise, and then you even gain more from that. That is phenomenal. And, and, you know, you've never shied away from challenges, not just at that early stage, but when there's a big challenge, you've been willing to take that way. It was going from enterprise sales to the B2C environment, from sales to marketing to uh, CEO roles and board roles. Walk us through a little bit of that trajectory of what has helped you step into bigger and bigger responsibilities, bigger and bigger roles and prepare yourself, not just from a skill standpoint, but also more importantly, from a mindset standpoint. Did you ever experience, you know, that moment of self doubt or limiting belief? And how did you overcome that? Oh, you know, I think we all experience those moments of self doubt. And, you know, I'm not unique, I experience them too. And, you know, how do you get through those? And we can talk about that. But in terms of your question of, you know, what was my journey? For whatever reason, I took a lot of jobs that were the first mm-hmm. kind of, you know, I told you the story about the sales um, situation, but also that happened later in my career in marketing. Um, and then I happened to, you know, um, and I hope most of us and all of us are lucky like this, but I worked for an amazing company, Sun Microsystems, and the leadership at Sun was very welcoming to new ideas. And they were very open to people who wanted to go tackle tough tough problems. And kind of, I would say in the middle of my marketing career, I had switched from sales to marketing. I thought marketing was amazing because it wasn't just about the quota I had or the quota my team had or the zip code or the te- or the sector that I was assigned to as a salesperson. It's about the whole market. Oh my gosh, now we can actually really make some change and some and make a difference here. So so marketing uh, kind of got caught my attention and I started my marketing career really at Sun Microsystems. And I had done every marketing job in the book uh, and the number of years that I was there. But the reason I bring them up is I worked um, uh, in an organization where, you know, God knows how many levels I was away from the CMO, many. And and I, it was early, early days about digital. People didn't really even know what it meant. Um, And I came up with this idea of like, we really need to have a digital marketing team at this company. Um, and 
it sounds so silly today because everything's digital today, but it honestly, it was just not, it was the beginning of email really in terms of being able to even talk to customers in a digital right. form. And so um, I made a proposal to the CMO. Um, his name is John Luacano. I still think of him as an amazing leader um, that said, Hey, I want to go do this. And I want to, you know, hopefully bring some people to go figure this out. And he quickly endorsed it, funded it, gave me a budget, told me I could hire some people. And we created a central e-marketing team for the organization that turned out to be the seed of the digital expertise of Sun in future years. And um, I tell that story because of your question around, like, how did you forge the path? Well, where you see opportunity, hmm. where you see, um, a pro- I said a problem a earlier, but, but a need or yeah. a, a potential gap. Go, go try to figure that out. Be creative mm-hmm. about that because, um, you know, I'm trying to teach my kids this. Like they're, you know, um, college age, going to be entering the working world and they're kind of learning what the process is to apply for a job and how do you go through, you know, the um, kind of methodology mm-hmm. to, to, to be considered. And yes, you need to do those things, but you have to also know you can break, you know, beyond barriers, right? You can create your own way of going after these things, which is actually very attractive to companies, very attractive to employers. I mean, this is what entrepreneurs do every day. But if you're going to go work for a big company or even a startup company, Mm -hmm. you want to be in the mode of how do I make things better? It's not just about the rules of today. It's about how do you bust through those to create the rules of tomorrow. It goes back to what you started with, which is all about creating value and, you know, having that mindset of, um, you know, the entrepreneurial mindset of just constantly innovating and looking to say where you can contribute the most. Um, Yeah. I remember early in my career um, as a marketing leader now, not as a sales leader, but there are a lot of, um, I worked at a company where there was a I don't know that this is unique, but a lot of men in the executive suite and a lot of women on the marketing team Mm -hmm. and, um, and women who were working really hard and young women, um, women who, um, maybe were entering the early stages of marriage or maybe having babies. Mm -hmm. And, um, I started, you know, feeling really, um, vulnerable because so many women on my team were taking maternity leave and leaving Mm -hmm to have their babies and some of them weren't coming back or we didn't know if they were coming back and life was changing and the company wasn't really ready for that, for Mm -hmm. all of these fantastic, hardworking, successful women. How do we support them? Because you look up and there's no one that looks like you up there. And so why would you come back? How would you fit in? So I, I remember creating, um, I remember going to HR and asking them, for their support to create the first job share at the company. Now, today, we have all sorts of flex time and job shares and um, support each other, but that didn't exist, a job share. What does that even mean? And so we created the first structure for a job share at the company that then was used as a template for other. Now, it happened to be women. No, No men applied for the job shares, but and, and that's okay. But, mm-hmm. but it was fantastic because we had now in the marketing department, we just didn't have a lot of women. We had women who were sharing jobs mm-hmm. and, and there was no question, two amazing, successful women sharing one job, you were getting way more <laughs> than one job of output. Um, and, um, and it gave them the lifestyle they wanted and needed with young babies at home. And it gave the company a tremendous amount of value. And that was one of the things early in my career, I realized, oh, as a manager, as a leader, again, like, let's do what makes sense, not just what was done up until today. And whether it was a job share, or whether it was working through more modern and more appropriate ways of thinking about women being supported in their career through their changing needs in life, whether it was creating a significant relationship whether it was having children in the home, whether you adopted or whether you um, uh, had a biological child, all of those things matter because these women were smart and amazing at work and we didn't want to lose them. So how, how did that work for you personally as well? Because with your career, 
and, you know, the incredible accomplishments you've had. How did you navigate that personally? As you know, you're sharing the story of supporting other women. But what about your own, um, you know, uh, decisions? And, you know, we often hear about those feeling guilty about trade offs or feeling like, you know, you, you, you're well, now you're getting into the hard stuff. <laughs> Um, you know, because you, it, it's so much easier, at least for me, to support and create connection with other women who are trying to do this. But in terms of yourself, it's super hard. This is like high level of difficulty kind of stuff. And, you know, I had um, my daughter is now 20. So it was, you know, almost 21 years ago that I was pregnant with her. And I did not have a boss that I felt was supportive. I had a boss who I felt um, very, very nervous about leaving my organization for a period of time. And I didn't do well in that um, first ma maternity leave, if we call it that. Um, I didn't do well at all because I never really took one. Mm -hmm. um, I stayed connected at work. I uh, went in to visit. I stayed in contact with the people that work for me. I was concerned about my level, my position, my security. And in looking back, it was all wrong. I should not have done that. The only thing that I can tell you that was that came good out of that, um, because it was a tremendous amount of anxiety and stress, um, is that I had a second baby and I did it better the second time. <laughs> I say in life, there, practice you always, makes perfect. <laughs> you always do things better the second time around. I don't care what it is. Uh -huh. Do yeah. everything at least twice in life because yeah. the second time is always better. So Eddie, my my son, that I did much better on maternity <laughs> leave and got to finally spend time with my daughter during that time too, since yeah. she was um, she was a toddler. And the second good thing that came out of that is no matter what I had thought I had done to support my female colleagues or female employees to that time, I never really understood until I went through it myself. Mm -hmm. And so it really changed the way, maybe not my intent, because my intent was always what mm -hmm. we talked about, but it changed the way that I spoke um, and the way that I asked questions, because I knew what you saw out here was not at all what was going on inside. It wasn't theory for me anymore. It was my life experience. And how did that shape you as a CEO, you know, and, and also what was it like, you know, the first time you took on a CEO role? <laughs> well, um, as it relates to women, I mean, I think you could probably unfortunately find dozens of women who got unsolicited advice from me um, when I knew they were pregnant. <laughs> um, I would just see them walking down the hall and say, you got to get in this conference room with me right now. I have advice for you and you must follow it because I didn't want them to screw it up the way that I screwed it up. Yeah. Um, and I wanted um, at a higher level, not speaking specifically to that issue, but as a CEO, you know, the number one thing that was important to me was the happiness of my customers and my employees. Um, and I never believed that you could have happy customers or even customers who were satisfied and um, um, uh, uh, appreciative of problem solving unless your employees were motivated to do that. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it really gets to culture. What kind mm -hmm. of culture do you want to have in your company? Because your culture shows on the outside too. Mm -hmm. And it's not, a, it's not just about joining a company that has really strong values that you can connect to as a person who's going to join that big organization or any organization. You have to connect and be aligned on values. But the fact that you would show those values and demonstrate those values outside of the walls of the internal company mm. to your customers, to your partners, to your investors and your shareholders, if you're a public company. Um, and, and that's what I thought about all the time is how is the culture that we're creating here, the culture that is going to um, have people excel to be the best they can be and therefore our customers are happy and therefore we are doing all the right things for investors and shareholders to, to grow and to have a strong financial profile. What if you could pinpoint the invisible ceilings limiting your success? 
Imagine having clarity on your strengths and barriers so you can take action and gain unstoppable momentum to advance as a future ready leader. Well, that's exactly what the Beyond Barriers quiz will help you discover. You'll get your personalized score based on the 25 essential elements proven to accelerate success in the digital age, so you can understand what's holding you back and where to focus your efforts. The Beyond Barriers quiz is completely free and takes just a few minutes. Go to imbeyondbarriers.com slash quiz and take the quiz today. I want to shift gears a little bit to... Um, board roles. You serve on multiple boards. Um, There are lots of very experienced and capable senior female leaders that have aspirations on serving on boards, but Mm -hmm. don't have any idea how to position themselves or Mm -hmm. even begin the process. If you had to give two to three very tangible recommendations, assuming that they have the experience. We're not questioning whether they have the ability of the experience or the suitability. Assuming that's the case, they just haven't been able to bridge that gap. What what uh, recommendations would you have? Well, uh, my couple of recommendations would be network, network, network. That's it. Assuming the capabilities, assuming mm-hmm. experience, assuming the, the, the skills, and that's another conversation around mm-hmm. what do boards look for. But assuming that that's a match, what women need to do today is to network better with other women who are on boards and other men who are on boards and specifically heads of non-gov committees, if you want really specific practical advice. Mm. Uh, because the head of non-gov for a board is responsible for recruiting new board members. They're responsible for the makeup and the diversity and the mm. um, uh, skill set uh, of the other people on the board so that there is a well-rounded um, and very strong skill set to support the company. And um, what I'm finding, and this has been something I've been really focused on the last year and a half or so, is that there's very few women who get the calls because they have the visibility of maybe the CEO experience that we talked Mm -hmm. about or the visibility of, oh, you're on that board that has a lot of visibility and therefore I want to call you for this board because that kind of makes sense, right? Or board members, you know them and so you get referred. So a lot, once you get your kind of first board, there's a lot ahead of you in terms Mm -hmm. of other experiences. But, um, but there's a lot of women who mm-hmm. are very well qualified. They just don't yet get the first call. And right. so visibility is everything right now for those women. Um, I just had a CEO tell me the other day who was looking for a new board member. And I, I, I don't have any more room for any more boards. And so I, was, I took the call because I wanted to speak with him about other women I know who I think could be available and are very mm-hmm. well qualified. And he said to me, Elisa, I didn't think there were, I didn't, you know, the myth of, I didn't think there were any women who had these skill sets. Like, are you kidding me? Yes, we're here. We're Where are the binders there. full of women? <laughs> yeah. And it's not just heads of marketing and heads of yeah. HR. Like, come on, there's, yeah. there's women attorneys and technical leaders and cloud experts. And like, we're all here. And there's many mm-hmm. organizations, at least in tech that are now helping women get that level of visibility. I just joined an advisory board for all raids. And um, and I did that for the very same reason that we're talking about, which is if I can use my visibility to then turn to other women who have fantastic qualifications, who haven't yet gotten the visibility and help lift that to be seen, that's fantastic. And that's exactly what we're doing with Accelerate with all raids. That's fantastic. So um, you mentioned, um, you know, visibility and, you know, growing that through networking. Um, Let's talk about what are one to two absolute critical skills in order to serve on boards. Obviously, well, there's a long list of accomplishments, but if they're yeah, if but, perspective, but they're non-negotiables. It's actually a really great question because boards are very structured. It mm-hmm. is not, oh, there's a great executive. I mean, sometimes it is, but mostly a board has a structure in which certain skill sets have to be there. You need to have a financial specialist, someone who is a CFO to be on audit mm-hmm. committee. Mm-hmm. You need to have a you know experienced executive with 
compensation for executive teams and board directors to head up the comp committee. Mm -hmm. You need experience with operator roles, like a CEO type of role to help Mm -hmm. coach and support the CEO in the seat of the company that you're Mm -hmm. on the board. You start to list, we do what's called the skills matrix Mm -hmm. for every board. And you make sure that your skills are diversified across these different things so that you can staff the right committees and so that you can spot the right questions to ask around strategy and you can deliver that level of value with the board. And so Mm -hmm. when you do those skills, the skills metric matrix for each board, the head of non-gov is always trying to fill in the gaps. And so not at every point in time is someone like you or someone like me um, the right match for company A or B because they're going through a life cycle with their skills matrix and whatever is open, they're trying to fill. So the CEO I was talking to the other day that I mentioned, he was looking for specifically, he needs someone on his board who is very um, uh, experienced in scaling cloud. Mm. And so he just assumed he couldn't find a female for that because it's an all the guys who know all about AWS and Google Cloud and and um, and Azure, etc. Well, I'm thrilled to say he now has um, a handful of female candidates, and he's having trouble deciding because oh. they're all so great. <laughs> so if we can help in any way to yeah. just get visibility, so that's when I say to you: you want practical advice network, make sure that you are getting to know. And if you don't know those people directly, find the people in your network who do know them directly Mm -hmm. and get some help because because we want to help. We need to help. The more visibility that the women who are qualified and experienced have, they get on their first board. The rest takes care of itself. They don't need help anymore. So now now she can turn and say, okay, who's the next woman I'm going to give visibility to? I mean, this is not rocket science. This is what men have been doing since the beginning of time. Right. And, and women, we are now doing it and we need to do it at scale. Exactly. And I think, you know, that networking also helps you understand, you know, how you can best position yourself, not just learn about those opportunities and get. Oh, the- that's right. I'll read Absolutely that. right. And by the way, interviewing for boards or asking questions to people in your network who are board directors to spend some time with them, those always pay off in the long run, too. Mm-hmm. I mean, we started this conversation, you asked me a question, and I talked about building enduring and long-lasting relationships Mm -hmm. with customers, but that's true across the board, Mm -hmm. whether it be with your colleagues, the people who work for you, your partners, your investors, your customers. I mean, building meaningful relationships helps everyone and helps you in your career Mm -hmm. with the steps you want to take whenever those steps might, might be right for you. Yeah. So one of the organizations that you're um, part of is Operator Collective. Mm-hmm. And um, want to get your perspective on advice for um, startup founders, female founders of startups. As um, Yeah. I mean, I have such respect for, for, for entrepreneurs who are starting their own company, period, whether you're a man or a woman. But then on top of that, being a female entrepreneur and then going to pitch for dollars and everything that's kind of lined up to fight you <laughs> um, in your efforts is just ridiculous. Uh, times are starting to change. Yeah. Operator Collective and what Malin and Layla are doing is really amazing. And giving... Uh, opportunity for underrepresented people, for females, for people of color, for all sorts of groups who have been overlooked Mm -hmm. for so many years, the opportunity to be funded, the opportunity to pitch to the fund that they're uh, that they're representing and that they actually raised, they raised themselves um, to be able to fund back uh, into the community is really awesome. And it's exciting because, you know, when Malin, went to start the fund, of course, suddenly all these females had opportunity to actually invest in something. Mm -hmm. And, you know, she might have told you the story, but there's so many of us that say, oh, wait, like, you know, we've been doing all this work in tech, but we didn't have the opportunity to invest. Now we have the opportunity to invest. And I think not only are they investing in fantastic companies led by female or underrepresented groups, but they also have investors who are females or underrepresented groups, which is awesome. 
And, and that's Let's how put that money ecosystem. to really great hard work. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that ecosystem just continues to flourish because as those female founders have, you know, uh, financial uh, accumulation and then eventual exits, they too then become investors. And No, and that's right. Uh, the problem we have, I mean, make you know this, but make no mistake about it. It's not enough. Mm -hmm. Right. It's not enough. And change is too slow and progress is too slow. And um, uh, with all of that being said, we are starting, I think, to see the opportunities to make change happen. And the more that we participate, the more that we make it visible, the more that we uh, contribute, the faster we can go. Mm -hmm. So from a um, startup standpoint, you've seen female founders that have scaled and gone public. I mean, Bumble is one of those phenomenal examples we're so proud of. And then there are so many women-owned businesses that don't even cross a million dollars, right? There's what barely two or 3% of women-owned businesses that ever cross a yeah. million dollars. If you had to, you know, both as a, you know, experienced um, leader and board member and investor, if you had to take a step back and distinguish between what makes, uh, you know, what helps one scale versus another, what are some differences that you've observed? Well, I mean, there's so many obstacles that women face in general. It's hard to pick that apart. So I would say center and focus on if you really want, some, some people don't want to make it big, right? Maybe yeah. I just want to be a million dollars and there's all sorts of reasons to do that. But on the question of what do I go for? Right. Assuming they're the, both the market, the, the, the market opportunity has to be there mm. and you have to be able to create that market opportunity. Even today in tech with fantastic startups with products, you know, you drool over, but there's not, it's either not a time, it's a timing issue, a product market fit issue, an issue of, um, is there a, a, a big enough uh, market for that? I mean, that's probably the hardest nut to crack. Mm -hmm. um, it's not about the talent. Sometimes the talent's fantastic and it's just not the right market. And that's, I think, why we see so many very successful failed founders yeah. because they do it once and then they do it again. And then, oh, maybe they hit it the third time or the fourth time, or maybe the product they originally started for this company actually isn't the product that went to market because they learned through the market feedback that, oh, actually we have to pivot in this direction or whatever. So I think, you know, really there's a business fit mm -hmm. first, and then there's all the other obstacles of everything else you have to do, whether you're a female or a male and right. females just have a longer list of obstacles. <laughs> yeah. and, and just short supply of funding or support and all of that. But I think the entrepreneurial journey is challenging regardless. So the grit and resilience and the agility that's required to be successful in that is absolutely critical. Um, and also your ability to um, um, spend time with peers and mentors mm -hmm. on what your obstacles are. I think we get so busy I look back at, you know, some of the stories I told you about early in my career and, you know, I was just heads down mm. it, it, and, and it is so valuable and it became so valuable to me when I started to learn about how to ask questions, be a better listener, show up to things that are not necessarily directly in my responsibility because I want to understand more. I want to understand the influences in the market. and so. Um, Having your head down too much of the time could ha could actually lose your visibility of of what you can learn. And so I would say whether it's a startup founder or whether you're working, you know, in a specific department in a company, carve out time for those things you don't know a lot about to be a listener and observer and continue to, you know, be a sponge on things you don't know because you become smarter and more aware. So speaking of awareness and things that we learn, the past year has been very challenging, but also transformative in many ways. Oh, man. What yeah. have you learned? What insight have you gained of something that personally for you has been the big aha over the past year? Uh, this sounds so simple. Um, but one of the things that I've learned by just being what I would just call cooped up, you know, you just feel cooped up 
is you got to get your body moving every day, whether it be your own exercise routine, whether it be walking your dog, whether it be, um, you know, I set up a little dance studio downstairs. So I put my disco ball up, like, (laughs) you know, you got to do something every moving your body creates a sharp mind. Mm. And when you sit on zoom all day and you know, you're really, we have, we have limited now in a good way. We have more time with our families, but we've limited our stimulus of like real life interactions to very few people. Mm -hmm. And so you can get in a real rut. And I think, you know, the very simple thing of getting physical every day so that you can keep your mind sharp and get that moving in your body is really, really important for our health and wellness. There's so many other things that are important for our health and wellness, but I have found personally um, that if I don't do that, I, I can really lose uh, perspective. Yeah. And Zoom fatigue is real. I mean, it's very real. real. It, it's, it real. it is, it is. Yeah. Um, so to close it out, let's talk about a daily habit that has personally been, um, you know, really powerful in your growth and your personal development that has sustained you throughout. Yeah, I would say um, my daily habit right now, besides what I told you about my disco ball, um, is talking every single day to my 20-year-old daughter and knowing what she's going through. That is my daily habit. Before I get into um, all of the things I'm responsible for and all of my um, needs of the things that I need to do. My daily habit is understanding where she is, how I can help and what struggles and challenges she is going through because it helps me get a real perspective of how, you know, life is impacting her. She's in college. She's, I think I mentioned she's 20 years old. Um, she's got big ambitions and passions and, you know, she's trying to figure out how to live life in this weird world. And it just helps me a lot. I think say, wow, like this is, it's different from what I'm going through and it helps keep me, um, uh, aware and really sharp about other influences. I think a lot of women listening to this are going to relate to that as moms and, you know, women that are going through all kinds of challenges and transitions during this period to see it from the lens of the next generation and what it takes to empower them. Yeah, no, exactly. I think that's right. And I think there's also, um, as you called it, Zoom fatigue. I I think just this fatigue in general, that life is not as stimulating as it was. We're Mm. not going places. We're not even going out to dip. We're starting to maybe go out to dinner, but there's just not a lot of diversity of where we are and who we're with. It's really important even with the fatigue. So this is hard advice, but to still do your homework. Mm. There's, um, I think this kind of, you know, we all need extra TLC right now. And so there's a lot of understanding and there should be. Um, And there's a lot of blending of work and personal life where it's not just, it's not work plus personal. It's, it's just life. It's, mm-hmm. it's everything blended together. I mean, I'm in this room and I'm doing an interview with you and, um, ne- but next thing I might do in this room is I'm going to wrap a birthday present and then, <laughs> uh, you know, I'm going to get out my vacuum and then I'm going to get on a board call. Like <laughs> that's all these things are happening in this one room. And my life is just like totally blended now. And we need to understand that with each other. We also need to show up prepared though. Mm-hmm. And I've seen, you know, I've just seen this kind of trend of like, well, I didn't have time for that. And I didn't have time for that. And I didn't have time for that. And I think that's going to get us. I think that's Mm going to bite us in the butt because we still have to be sharp and we still have to be, you know, ready. And if we're not ready today, then let's just be honest and say, I'm not ready today. Mm -hmm. Like too many things happened this morning and I'm not ready today, but I'll be ready tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So adapt you know, and the way we, things are and just, you know, make it work for you. And we best. still have to be ready. 
Absolutely. Well, that's great advice. And Elisa, thank you so much for sharing your story and your journey and all of the strategies that will work for you. I'm um, excited for everyone around the world to hear this and learn from you and um, excited to continue to support your success as you lead the way. It's been my absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to the Beyond Barriers podcast. There are thousands of podcasts out there. And we are so grateful that you've chosen to listen to ours. If you enjoyed the show, please leave us a rating and tell a friend about it and subscribe to get new episodes every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Visit IamBeyondBarriers.com where you'll find show notes, links, and the best way to connect with our guests. See you next episode.